going to make, we're going to make a, an analogy here, right? And so I'm going to call something like the shiny diner, right? So think of this as something on Broad Street in Birmingham, which um, I had the pleasure of walking up and down last week. And there's a new diner on Broad Street, and we're going to call it the shiny diner. Uh, and within that diner, um, and for for most part, I want you to consider yourself as kind of like the manager of this diner, right? So you're the one that just opened it. Um, and so uh, just keep that in mind. So within your diner, um, everything that you're going to be cooking up is going to be a recipe associated with that food item. And so when you compare a recipe to something within Shiny, this really means like the R code itself. So that app.r script, right? So that's kind of the comparison we'll make today. You also have to hire some chefs, right? These are the ones that are going to be reading the recipe and actually cooking the meal. And so within the Shiny world, this is basically your R session. All right, so the R session is what interprets this app.r file and will actually create that Shiny application. We also have your kitchen, all right? This is where the, the chef is gonna live for the most part. And this is going to be your computer if you're running Shiny locally or potentially your server if you're running a server-based implementation of um, our studio. And then we have your food item, all right? This is your deliverable. And this is basically the render Shiny application that we'll be talking about. All right, so let's say that you've opened up your diner uh, the very first day, your first customer walks in, they sit down, they place an order, that order goes to the kitchen, the chef cooks up the meal and delivers the food and this customer is just ecstatic. They love the food and they wanna tell all their friends. All right, so they tell all their friends and then a couple hours later, you get like six, seven or so people entering your diner. And this is still fine, all, right? all seven of these folks are placing orders, the chef can accommodate all those meal requests, cook them up in a reasonably fast amount of time and deliver that food and everyone's super happy. All right, people are very happy. They start writing Google reviews, Yelp reviews and very quickly your diner starts gaining some traction. All right, so now you got about 10, maybe 15 people in your diner. And for the most part, you know, things are still running smoothly. All right, your chef's feeling a little stressed out but for the most part, they're still able to um, cook up all the meals and deliver the food in a reasonably amount of time. Everyone's very happy, all right? And now that we've kind of reached this mass and people are starting to tell more of their friends, the next day you open up your doors and you just get this huge influx of people, all right? Now you have 20, 30, 40 people in your diner and this is just way too much for the chef to handle, all right? The chef is incredibly stressed out. The kitchen's on fire. Some people are happy to get their meals, but for the most part, you're gonna start seeing some really unhappy customers in your diner, all right? And so the question that you have to come up with right, as the manager of the Shiny Diner is what is my breaking point, all right? So how many customers can visit my diner before things start to break, before things, you know, customers start to be really unhappy. But if we translate that to the Shiny ecosystem, this breaking point, it really means like how many users can visit my Shiny application at the exact same time before things start to break down. All right, and this process is known as benchmarking. So we're gonna talk about some tools that can help you with benchmarking your Shiny application because it's really like your first step. All right? You really wanna see in my application in its current state, how many people can visit it at the same time. If it's less than what I need, then I gotta start making some tweaks and make it better, all right? So how to uh, load test your Shiny application. So we have a tool called Shiny Load Test, load test that we've built here internally at Posit. So it's a, it's a package and there's gonna be another tool that we'll talk about here in a second. So I'm not gonna run through a, a full example in a live, but I'm gonna just kind of walk you through the steps of running a Shiny Load Test. So the first thing for Shiny Load Testing is you just run your Shiny application. So this could be running you know, locally within your instance of the RStudio IDE, or you can have it hosted somewhere, whether that be shinyapps.io or Posit Connect. So once it's running, you then record a session, all right? So you use the Shiny Load Test package and use this record function, record session function, and you just point it to the URL of that Shiny application. So again, it could be hosted in Connect, or it could be kind of your local address running within the RStudio IDE. Once it's running, you interact with it, right? So you potentially click some buttons, you slide some bars, move some tabs, and then you close it out, and that generates something known as a recording log, right? So everything you did within that application gets recorded, and you feed that recording log into a different tool, 
And this tool is called Shiny Cannon. And the best part about Shiny Cannon is it allows you to generate synthetic users to your application. And so in this example, and I should note that this is a command line interface tool, all right? So we're moving outside of the RStudio IDE into the command line. So we use this recording log, we have Shiny Cannon, we provide the URL of our Shiny application, and then we generate workers, all right? These are, again, these are synthetic workers. In this example, we're just gonna generate four, but if you wanted to generate 10, 200, 1,000, 10,000, you can do that. And then you just give some information, like how long do you want them to interact it with for, and then the output for the, the analysis. And that's pretty much it. And then you just analyze the results. Now there's a lot of different results that spit out from shiny load tests, but this is probably the most common one that you'll see. So what are we looking at here? So in this plot, on the Y axis, we're looking at those four simulated users, okay? Um, and then along the X axis, we had that elapsed time. In this example, we're just using 600 seconds. And then you're gonna see in each row for each simulated user, there's a series of colored blocks. Now these blocks, you can kind of see down here with the legend, what they represent. But for the most part, this represents time the Shiny application is thinking. So imagine you open up a Shiny application and you click on a box, and then you have to wait some time before that application becomes responsive again. All right, so that wait time is represented by these colored blocks. And ideally, you want to shrink that wait time as much as possible. All right, that makes sure your application remains snappy as you interact with it. And so what this is showing, uh, you can see a bunch of blue blocks, the red, orange, some green in there as well. But you also see some gray background. So the gray background from the plot showing through. And that's ideally what you want to see is more of that gray background and these colored blocks becoming thinner and thinner. So here's an example of a bad Shiny application. It does not scale well. So here we've generated about 16 synthetic users, all right, over a same amount of time for the most part. And when users are interacting with it, so again, think of it as 16 concurrent users to your Shiny application. For the most part, they're clicking on things and then waiting, 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 because we're not seeing any of that gray background showing through. So this would be an example when you would kind of take a step back and say like, all right, my application with 16 simulated users, it's not gonna work well. So you gotta start thinking about ways to improve it. Okay, so now we've ran a shiny load test and we basically, we figure out what's our breaking point, all right? So we know when there's like seven or eight, you know, we're totally fine. But once we get to 20, 30 or something like that, things start to break down. So as the manager of the shiny diner, you start brainstorming ways of how can I improve my diner? How can I make it faster so that I can accommodate more folks to my diner? So one thing you could potentially do is build some additional kitchens, right? So now your single chef can be cooking multiple meals at the exact same time at these different kitchen stations. Sure, that works great. You could also think about hiring more chefs, right? So now we have three more chefs all sharing a single kitchen. So there might be some bottlenecks there, but for the most part, you can have these chefs doing different things and it should improve the performance of your application. That's great. Sometimes you have to do both. You have to hire more chefs, you have to hire more kitchens. This would be great as well, but it's important to note that what we've talked about so far, so hiring more chefs or building more kitchens, that costs money. Right? And as a manager, as you just started this diner, you may not have that money uh, right from the get-go. Um, sh I should note though, that a lot of times, depending on your application and depending on who you're delivering this application to, sometimes the scaling vertically, um, what we're showing right here, so adding more chefs or more kitchens is the solution, right? Sometimes you just have to give it some more compute power uh, for your shiny applications. You know, one of my colleagues is, you know, reminded me that Google is not built on a single server. So sometimes you do have to scale in this fashion by adding more kitchens or adding more chefs. But there's some other things that we can do as well as a shiny developer. And so one thing we can do now switching over back to the manager of the shiny diner is think about how can we improve our operations of the chef, All right? So how can we make them a little bit more efficient in the kitchen? So what do you do? As a manager, um, you might take a chair and you just sit down in the kitchen and you just watch your chef in action. All right, so a meal comes in and the various, these are the various steps that the, the chef goes through. So they first collect the ingredients, prepare them, cook them up, assemble the meal, and then finally serve that meal. 
And now while the chef is going through these steps, you might have a stopwatch and you just time how long each step takes. So maybe the first step takes two minutes. Um, and then you see uh, preparing the ingredients and cooking seems to take about the most amount of time. So you got 15 minutes here. Assembling goes pretty quick and serving is pretty instantaneous, about a minute. So this process of kind of basically looking at every step of your you know, chef's process and figuring out what's slow, what's fast, this is known as profiling. And we can do this within Shiny applications as well. Now, before we actually dive into how to profile a Shiny application, there's one important rule that I want to emphasize, and that is don't guess. Even if you are the primary developer of this Shiny application, there's never any reason why you should guess on what's slow and what's fast for your Shiny application. So another really great quote from uh, Joe Chang, again, our chief technology officer, he said, don't use your intuition, don't guess because your intuition stinks. I don't even know you, but it stinks. And really what Joe's is trying to say is that you don't have to guess. You don't have to use your intuition. There are tools out there that will tell you exactly what's slow and what's fast. And probably the most popular tool to do that is something known as PropViz. This is another open source package, which basically allows you to profile your Shiny application. And so you can see in this GIF, I'm interacting with a Shiny application, I close it out and then it generates this report. This is a pretty extensive one, but you can see at the top, like how much memory, time, you can see all these blocks on here. These represent different components of your Shiny application. And you can see exactly how much time each step took and how much memory is being uh, required for each step. So, that example had a pretty extensive report. This is a much simpler example. Um, and it's not actually using Shiny, but the same principles uh, apply. So let me just quickly go through this. And we actually talked about this in our last um, uh, workshop back in the earlier, uh, I think on the 1st of November. So this might be just a quick review for some folks. But what we're looking at here, prop viz, right? So we have this function here and within prop viz, we just have a data set. And then we have the four lines of code, four, five, six, and seven. All right? And each line of code here does the exact same thing. All it does is find the column means of this data set. So we use the apply function, call means, L apply, V apply. But what's really important to know is that despite these four lines of code giving you the same answer, they actually from under the hood behave very differently. And that's what Profis tells us. So you can see that apply function actually uses the most amount of memory. So memory being allocated or deallocated and how much time it takes to run that line of code. And you can see it's like 900, I think this is milliseconds. But then as we go through here, we have call means, L apply, and then finally V apply, which is a vectorized operation. You can see it requires ultimately pretty much no memory and goes in a fraction of the time. So these little things where you can actually see how long each step of your application uh, takes and kind of see what's the slow things and then try to brainstorm ways to improve it. And you can basically find that out using a tool like Profiz. All right, so you've run Profiz for your Shiny Diner and you start brainstorming ways that you can improve the processes of your chef. So these are some things that you come up with. Maybe you can try preparing the ingredients in advance, right? So maybe instead of every time a meal order comes in, the chef has to take the time to you know, cut up the, the carrots or, or something like that. Instead, maybe having everything already prepared for them. Keeping the kitchen organized and updated. So making sure the chef's not you know, running around the kitchen trying to figure out where everything is, or maybe just making sure you have the right tools for the job. Preparing the most popular meals in advance. Um, so I, I always give the analogy of maybe instead of a diner, you actually work at a pizzeria. And then, you know, nine out of 10 customers, when they come in, they love your margarita pizza. So it might make sense to have, you know, some margarita pizzas ready to go since it's your most popular meal and you can deliver those instantaneously. And then multitasking, you know, trying to train your chef to potentially work on multiple meals at the exact same time. So we're gonna step through these various uh, um, ways to make your chef more efficient and then translate that to uh, the Shiny application. So the first one I mentioned <clears throat> is preparing your ingredients in advance. And just imagine that someone walks into your diner and orders a ham sandwich, and these are the ingredients the chef has to work with. So they're gonna to have to spend some time before they can start cooking, you know, slicing the bread and tomato, um, the cheese, lettuce, cutting up the ham in order to create this ham sandwich. And that takes time. 
But what would be a lot better is if your chef, that order came in for a ham sandwich and this was their starting material where everything's prepared and ready to rock and they can whip up that sandwich in a fraction of the time. So how do we translate this over to Shiny applications? So probably the most popular way um, to improve your Shiny application, I would say popular, probably the most common way to uh, prepare, to um, improve your Shiny apps is to prepare your data in advance. I'd say for most folks I've worked with um, right here that their Shiny applications are slow. A lot of times it's because the data they're working with is fairly large. Uh, and potentially there's ways that you can you know, shrink that data or just prep the data so it only the data that the Shiny application needs is actually being leveraged. So a few things here to note about preparing your data in advance. It's really important to make sure you read and process this data only once, right? Sometimes you might slide a bar left and right or check a box and it rereads in the same data over and over and over again. So it's just a quick little fix to make sure that's not happening. And you potentially wanna just make sure this is in the header of your Shiny application. One of the best ways to improve your applications, if you can take that big data set and move it somewhere else like a database and just have that shiny application make calls to that database that will always improve uh, your applications and make them more scalable. And then move any data processing steps outside of shiny applications. All right, so if there's anything the shiny application does when it starts up, like, you know, cleans up some data set, trains a model or something like that, but it's not really needed for that shiny application, then try to think about moving it outside. So you can take these cleaned up data sets and store them as a pin on the Posit Connect server. So if you're not familiar with pins, this is a great opportunity to do that. You can also make data available or models available using a plumber API, which I know we talked about a little bit last week. Um, or you can do things like um, the cleaning of your data or training a model is you can also um, script them into an R Markdown document post those and posit connect and have those scheduled to run, all right? So if new to data is available every single morning, you can have this R markdown and rerun that, um, you know, all that code to reprocess that data, potentially again, save it as a pin or a Plumber API. So these are some ways to think about moving that data processing step outside of your Shiny app. All right, so the second point I mentioned is keeping your kitchen organized and updated. So what do I mean by that? So if you're the, the chef, uh, and you are hired into this diner and you have an option of working into uh, you know, two different kitchens, you know, a kitchen over here on the left where everything's nice and neat and organized or something you see like over here on the right where it seems pretty cluttered and you're just kind of hard to find stuff. So I'd probably guess that most folks would be uh, more willing to work in a kitchen like this on the left. So making sure everything's organized is really important. And let's say as the manager of your diner, your chef says, hey, I need a new kitchen knife, right? And when you get that request, you deliver either this rusty old dull knife or potentially even worse, you give your chef a medieval sword. All right? These are not the right tools for the job. And ultimately, you want to make sure you have a nice, sharp, clean kitchen knife for your chef. So within the Shiny app world, this basically means optimizing and organizing your code and functions. All right? We're going to talk about a few different things here. The first one is making sure you're using the right functions, uh, the fastest functions for the job. And there's a few different ways to kind of test if one function is better than another function. I'm just gonna highlight one called bench, uh, which I'll talk about here in the next slide. Making sure you call code in the correct spot. This is kind of alluding to what I mentioned in the last one, where for example, making sure your data is not being reread every single time and only being read in once. So that's making sure it's in the right spot. Avoid copying code. This is just a good rule of thumb, not just for Shiny applications, but really any um, R code in, uh, in general. So if you find yourself copying, pasting the same code over and over and over and over again, and maybe just tweaking one thing in each, you should think about you know, organizing it better and putting it into a function, for example. Vectorize operations. You know, R may not be the fastest language out there, but it's really good at vectorized operations. So trying to minimize those lengthy for loops and converting those into a vectorized um, operation. And then finally, just organizing things. As your Shiny applications grow in complexity, you might want to think about splitting them up into modules. And so we'll touch upon that here in a second. But the first thing I want to mention is this thing called bench. So let's run through an example of how to use this bench fun uh, package, which again is another open source package. So at the very top of your screen, we see two different functions, mean one and mean two. 
The first one just basically wraps the mean function itself. So we're taking the mean of some vector called x. And then we have mean two, it does the exact same thing, but it basically spells out the mean function. So we take the sum of x and divide it by the length of x. Just importantly that both of these do the exact same thing. And then we just generate a random vector x, and then we run it through this bench mark function. All right, so that's kind of the, the plan words here. And we take mean one and mean two, and we basically face them off uh, one v one, and then we collect some information about you know the the minimum amount of time it takes, the median iterations per second, and to see how well they perform. And what's really interesting, you can see down here with like the min and median is that the mean two function actually goes a little bit faster than mean one, which is surprising because mean one looks a lot simpler than mean two. Now I'm not advocating that everyone goes into their shiny applications and removes all the mean functions and spells it out. Sometimes it's easier, at least for readability and organizational purposes to keep the mean x. But this is just a good example of how you can take two different functions um, and kind of just you know compete them one v one and see which one might be a little faster to hopefully speed up your application at some points. So benchmark is a really good uh, function within this bench package. The next one I just wanna briefly talk about uh, is calling code in the right spot. So there's gonna be a lot of code in this slide, but it's all dummy code. I'll just quickly run through it here. Uh, at the very top of your screen, you're seeing my data prep, and we have this function. All right, we're creating a function here. So in this, uh, within this function, we have a few lines of code. And the first line you'll see is read.csv. And we just give it some path to see some, some CSV files, so potentially our data. And we're saving that as DF, shorthand for data frame. And then we take this data frame, we pipe it into some other functions. We filter some non-important stuff out. We group by some other variables and potentially do some other slow functions, okay? So, we take this function, my data prep, and we pop it into our Shiny application. And this first example, you can see we're in the server portion, and we're actually within a reactive statement. So again, reactive statements are when someone interacts with your application, you know, the Shiny application reacts to that change and does something, potentially running all this code in this reactive statement. And so you can see right here, the first line in my reactive function here is my data prep, this function that we created up here. So anytime someone interacts with this portion of your Shiny application, it's going to rerun this my data prep function, which is going to reread in your data over and over and over and over again. So again, potentially your Shiny application has a little slider bar, which is being controlled by this reactive function. And every time someone slides that bar, it's going to reread in that data, which is just, you don't need to do that. So what would be a lot better is if you take this my data prep function that we created up here and move it outside of the server function or any reactive statement. This way, when the Shiny application is first opened up by the end user, it reads in that data once, saves as DF, and then its DF variable is available for the entire length, you know, the application remains active and it's only read in once. So again, this is just a reminder to, Think about you know, where you're actually placing your code in order to kind of uh, prevent any redundancy with your Shiny apps. Then I also wanted to mention Shiny modules. I think over the past you know, five plus years, Shiny modules have certainly kind of gained popularity. And we're not gonna go into the depth of creating a Shiny module. I just wanna give a high level overview of what they are. And this is again, something we touched upon earlier this month in our last workshop. Well, let's say you have an application that looks something like this over on the left-hand side. And really the, the big take home here is that the Shiny application isn't huge, but you can already see that some components of your Shiny application talk to other components and these arrows are starting to point all over the place and it's getting a little confusing. Now imagine you have like a, a bug in the Shiny application, which we're gonna talk about in our next uh, presentation. But let's say you have a bug here, you know, you're just, you've, have to now kind of walk through this messy shiny application to figure out where is this bug arising. So when your applications start to grow in complexity, you can start thinking about separating them out into their own separate modules, all right? So here's that same shiny application, but now broken up into various modules with related functions. So we have some components that are related to the session information, the data, HPC environment, and the results. And these modules are basically independent. So you can run one of these modules completely by itself, which makes it much more digestible for organization and also debugging purposes. 
All right, so the next step, going back to our shiny diner, we mentioned that you know if you have a pizzeria and everyone loves your margarita pizza, sometimes it makes sense to prepare some of those pizzas beforehand. So when that chef comes in first thing in the morning, they just prep like 20 margarita pizzas, store them in this hot box. And then when those customers start coming in and they order margarita pizza, margarita pizza you can deliver it immediately. So within Shiny App World, this translates to caching your outputs. All right, and so what do I mean by that? There's a bunch of text here. I'm not gonna dive too much into it, but basically if your application has a series of inputs, so let's say, you know, some slider bars and some check boxes and some combination of those inputs generates an output, right? That output, you can basically save it into a cache for your Shiny application. And if your Shiny application ever sees that same combination of inputs ever again, rather than regenerating that output, it can just reach into the cache and deliver that same output, just like it did with uh, the pizzas here. So let me give you another example here of kind of how Shiny caching works. So here is some example code. Uh, it's not real code, but it, just, it does drive home the point where we have an output, right? We have a plot output and we're generating it using render plot function. It pulls in some data and then we just plot some data. And there's one input within this uh, render plot function, input dollar sign state. So within our Shiny application, you can see up here, we have this little drop down menu and you can select a various state in the United States to generate this map, All right? And as you can see here, I've selected Maryland, that's my home state uh, and it generates this map. And it took about four seconds to generate. It's not a huge amount of time, but you know, if someone's interacting with your application and starting to go through all the various states, you know, waiting five, maybe 10 seconds for uh, these spots to pop up, it's just not the fastest thing in the world. And so what you might consider doing, since there's only one input here and a set number of possibilities, so 50 states in the United States, you can think about caching those various outputs, all right? And so, for example, I can cache Maryland. To do that, you just pipe the output of this um, code up here into a bind cache and give it that input, the input state. And so now when I select Maryland, it'll generate this plot and this plot will be basically saved into a cache. And then if another user somewhere down the line or potentially myself somewhere down the line goes back in this application, instead of it taking four seconds when I select Maryland, I can now select Maryland and it takes you know a you know, microsecond basically to uh, generate this plot. So this is a really great strategy if your application has a set number of outputs. So maybe there's only maybe 20 or 10 or so outputs your Shiny application can deliver. You might want to think about caching those outputs. And you don't have to cache everything. Some outputs can be cached and others uh, don't necessarily have to be. All right, the last one we're going to talk about is multitasking. So with our Shiny Diner, it'd be really nice if your chef at the same time, could have a turkey going in the oven. At the same time, has some pasta sauce going on the stovetop and right next to it, maybe some stir fry. All right, so these are basically three different meals uh, being cooked at the exact same time. So how do we do that within a shiny app world? So we can use a technique known as asynchronous programming. And this is a pretty advanced technique, but it's really good for multitasking especially because R is single threaded. And this basically means that as R is, if R is doing a task, right? So maybe it's training a model or it's generating a plot and that time is taking to run that code, you really can't do anything else, right? It's kind of just frozen in that state. But we can get around this by using something known as asynchronous programming. And there's a few packages that can help out here like promises and futures. We'll talk about that in a second. But this is also a good reminder that if possible, if you have any steps in your application that don't necessarily need to be in your application, like you know some ETL process with your data or cleaning up some data or training a model, think about moving those outside of your application and maybe popping them into a Plumber API, for example. But let me give you an example of how async programming works. Let's say this is your application. And we'll just, for example, we'll call it the analyze data application. And it does two different things. You can uh, supply some inputs and you can plot the data. And this is a pretty fast step. It only takes about a second to generate that plot. Or you can take this data and you can run a model on it. All right? And this model might take you know, a minute or so to run. Now, again, this application is using a single R process. So let's say you have some users um, open up your application and all they wanna do is plot some data. So they select some inputs, they click on this button, 
and it only takes a second to run. So these four users are plotting data, they're going crazy and they're having fun, all right? They can generate as many plots as they want and get those results instantaneously. So let's say, for example, before those users jump in, you have someone that wants to train a model. So they open up the application, they select the inputs and they run a model. Now this user is fully aware that running the model may take a minute or two. So they click run model, maybe they go grab some coffee and they just wait for the model to complete. All right, but this basically occupies that single R process. So now if other users come into that application and they wanna just plot the data, which normally only took a second, now they have to wait for this model to finish running before they can plot the data. So something that used to take about a second is now taking you know, greater than a second, potentially over a minute uh, to generate. And this is a bad user experience uh, for this um, specific application. So what we can instead do is make any of those long running processes like training a model or potentially any long ETL process to make it set as a promise. And that tells this user who's running this model um, that this job will run eventually, all right? So maybe instead of taking a minute or two, maybe it takes three minutes, maybe four minutes, that's okay. The user is fully aware of that the modeling step takes a while. And so what it allows you to do is that when a user clicks on run model, it can pause that action and then service the users where there's a much faster step, all right? So the model training process stops, it services these four users so they can generate those plots. When they're done, it can go back to the modeling step and complete that action, all right? So again, that's the, uh, the process known as async programming. Okay, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, for improving your Shiny applications and making them more production ready. So I just wanna do a quick review here. Then we're just gonna use this uh, example application, uh, kind of a visual application to show we have our user interface, which has you know, selecting some inputs, displaying some outputs. We have our server, which reads in, reads in some data, cleans it, creates a model, renders a prediction, and also renders a plot. And then we have some data that this application depends on. So we first talked about preparing your data in advance. All right, so I mentioned before that if at all possible, um, any data that your application needs, if you can clean it beforehand, such as in the R Markdown document or just you know as a pin, you can take those steps and you can completely remove them from the Shiny application. A good rule of thumb is that Shiny really is a visualization tool. It's not really designed to be a super powerful workhorse. You know, you can sometimes create some really powerful Shiny applications. Um, but you should, when thinking about production Shiny applications, you wanna make it kind of as like a visualization. Um, so it's not doing any heavy lifting under the hood. So we can take some of those steps out like cleaning the data, for example, and then also pre-processing your data as well or making them accessible in other forms as well. So instead of your application depending on that data, so basically you know, incorporating that data into the application itself, Think about storing it somewhere like a database or potentially as a pin or a plumber API, for example. Then we talked about optimi optimizing and organizing your code and functions. Um, so for example, here, when we read in the data, we use the function called read.csv, which is totally fine. But it's worth noting that there's other functions out there that can read CSV files even faster. So if you have a really large CSV file, it may take a couple seconds to read it in. You can use other things like fread, for example, which can read in those CSV files faster. And then you wanna make sure that any step that only needs to be done once, such as reading in data, is only done once every time you know, a user is interacting with your Shiny applications. Next, we have caching your outputs, all right? So if your application, again, has a set number of outputs, then you may wanna think about, um, you know, some, some of these plots can definitely be cached and be delivered to the end user in a much faster fashion, rather than having to regenerate them every single time uh, the user has that same number of uh, a combination of inputs. And then finally, async programming. So if your application has some slow running step, but also some fast running steps, you might wanna take some of these slow running steps and convert them into a promise, which again, just tells the user that this step will eventually run, um, but we're gonna allow the faster jobs to complete first. All right, so everything we've talked about so far has basically been code oriented. So ways to, that you can prove the design and the code within your Shiny application to make them more production ready. 
Um, but I want to focus now on, let's say you have an application ready to go and you want to share it with the world. How do you do that? So before we talk about that, let's just go back to the shiny diner analogy. And again, you are the manager of your shiny diner. And as a manager, you have the option to, uh, or the choice basically to figure out how many chefs you want to hire for your diner. So maybe you want four chefs. And then you also have to set basically a threshold of how many people can be in my diner to ensure they have a good user experience, a good customer experience. So these you know, questions that you need to kind of answer as a manager, there's a tool that we have that can help out with that. And that's known as RStudio or, or Posit Connect. Posit Connect allows you to host Shiny applications. Um, it can also host a variety of other content as well. So I mentioned this in my talk last week, but I'm just kind of quickly showing some of the other things that you can host uh, within R, but also Python as well, right? But Shiny being one of the more popular uh, pieces of content to host on Posit Connect. And so once it's hosted in Posit Connect Shiny application, you have control over how many basically chefs you want to support that application, and then also how many users can access your application. So let's go back to the Shiny Diner to kind of you know, drive home what I'm talking about here. So as a manager, let's say you hire one chef for your, for your diner, and then you determine that I want this diner to only accommodate up to 10 people, all right? So this chef can service up to 10 customers. Now within Posit Connect or within the Shiny world, what this basically means is you can have one R process, all right? So that's your chef, your R process, managing up to 10 users of your Shiny application or basically 10 customers. Now, when you publish an application to Posit Connect, we have an option, this uh, tab right here called Runtime. And this basically allows you to control some of these things that I'm mentioning here. So I just wanna talk about these three options right here, max processes, min processes, and max connection per process. So a process, again, is basically a chef. So in this configuration, we're saying we can have up to one chef or one R process supporting this application. Min processes is set to zero, and we'll talk more about that here in a second. And then max connections per process. So again, a connection is basically a user, someone actually accessing your application uh, per process. So in this configuration, like you're seeing here, we have one chef with 10 concurrent users. All right, so we can have up to 10 folks uh, accessing this application. Now, maybe after some time, uh, again, being the, the, the manager of your shiny diner, you determine that 10 might be a little too much for a single chef. So you decide to hire a second chef and split the workload in half, all right? So chef one will have up to five concurrent users or five customers and chef two will have the same. So it's important to note here that you're doubling your chef count, but you still can have up to 10 concurrent um, people in your diner. So what does this translate to Posit Connect? All right, so here we just bump up the max processes. So our processes to two, so you can have up to two processes supporting this application. And then we drop the number of connections per process. So we can have up to five customers or five users accessing each process uh, supporting the Shiny application. All right, so this is the configuration within Posit Connect that you would see over here. All right, so we haven't talked about min processes last. So let me kind of explain how this works within the Shiny Diner first. Let's say your diner is actually like a 24 hours, seven days a week diner. And in the wee hours of the morning, like two, three o'clock in the morning, it's pretty quiet. You haven't had a customer maybe in a few hours, but then some person just wanders into your diner and says, I want a cheeseburger. Now, if your chef is basically taking a nap in the kitchen, they're going to have to wake up. They're going to have to turn on all the burners. They're going to have to grab the meat out of the freezer, potentially by the thaw or something like that. And it takes a long time to start up before they can actually cook that hamburger. Okay. So if that's the situation, you might always want to have a chef in the kitchen ready to go. Right? All the burners are on, the ingredients are all prepped and ready to rock. So even if someone wanders in at two, three o'clock in the morning, you can quickly whip up that burger and deliver it to a customer. So if that's the use case here, um, then you might want to think about, at least for the Shiny application, setting min processes to one. And what this basically means is that this, your application never goes to sleep. All right, so when that first user logs in, your application starts up and then it never shuts down. There's always at least one R process supporting your application. And this is a good use case if your Shiny application has a long startup time. So maybe it takes like 
you know, 10 minutes to read in the data and process it or train the model. Again, steps that hopefully you can take outside the application. But let's say your application needs to do that. Then you might want to think about setting our processes to one if it has a long startup. And then the last kind of configuration we'll talk about here is really the VIP experience. So let's say now you have a five star diner and you want to make sure that every customer in your diner has the best experience possible. So you end up hiring multiple chefs. I would say 10 chefs in this configuration and each, each chef is now responsible for a single customer. So in this scenario, um, when we configure that within Posit Connect, we bump up the number of processes all the way up to 10, all right? So we're hiring 10 chefs. Now we can have 10 separate R processes to put in our application. And then we drop the number of connections per process way down to one. So again, here we have 10 chefs and each chef is gonna have only one user to your application. So this is really a VIP experience, which means that they get the, every person that walks into your, uh, your uses your application gets the kind of completely dedicated R process and all those resources backing it. It's important to note that the more you bump up this number, this 10 processes, you know, these are separate R sessions. Think about it, every time you open up the R Studio IDE, you're basically spawning an R Studio or an R process. So think of it as like 10 separate R Studio sessions now supporting your application. Um, so it's just important to note that make sure you have a, you know, uh, an environment, a server um, that can support all of these sessions. All right, just a quick recap before we take a small break here, how uh, we talked about a bunch of things like benchmarking and profiling your shiny applications to figure out, you know, is your application slow and, you know, what parts of your application need to be improved upon and then how to optimize your application. So preparing the data, async programming, caching, quality checking your code, these are all really important. And then finally, when you have your application ready to rock and you want to share it with the world, you can post it on Posit Connect and tweak some of those runtime settings um, to hopefully make that user experience as optimal as possible. All right, so we're at 47 minutes after the hour. Um, maybe what we can do is take, uh, I don't wanna do 15 minutes. Let's take a, a 10 minute break. Maybe we can do five minutes before the hour. So when the clock hits uh, uh, 55, we can convene back and we can do uh, the next, presentation, which we debugging shiny applications. So encourage folks to get up, stretch your legs, uh, grab some water if needed. Um, I'll kick around for a few minutes here. If anyone has any questions, you can either pop them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, but let's go ahead and reconvene at 55 minutes um, after the hour. Perfect. All right, so let me reshare my screen and then we'll get going here. All right, so this next session is gonna be on debugging Shiny applications. Um, so maybe not super related to what we just talked about in terms of you know making production ready Shiny apps, but certainly, as you're tweaking your code and trying to make your application better, uh, sometimes uh, some you know unintentional bugs might slip into your code and sometimes they're easy to figure out what's going on and sometimes they're not. And so we're gonna talk about ways to identify you know, where in your code bugs arise and some strategies on how to actually fix them. So, um, Again, we'll talk about you know what actually makes debugging shiny applications particularly hard, um, and then some of the resources for de debugging it, um, not only within like R itself, but also within Shiny. And then we'll talk about various strategies for debugging, mostly tracing, debugging, error handling. Uh, and this is in fact a picture of a shiny bug. Uh, same resources, well, a lot of the same resources that we talked about in our last presentation, this Mastering Shiny book. If you don't already have a bookmark, go ahead and bookmark it now. Again, it's completely free. Just Google Mastering Shiny by Hadley Wickham. 
Uh, but there are some other resources as well, such as the Advanced R book by Hadley as well, uh, which has some really great debugging strategies, mostly for just R code, which certainly can apply to Shiny applications as well. But there is a whole section in Mastering Shiny uh, really pertaining to debugging specifically Shiny applications. Uh, there's also some really great talks and other resources as well for debugging in R. Now again, if you want to follow along, um, I do have a GitHub repo that has all the code for this application or for the content we'll talk about today. And then I just tweaked the link as well and I posted it into the chat. Um, and I can actually repost it just to make sure folks have it. Um, so that link will be an instance to Posit Cloud, um, where you can actually open up some of the applications and run them for yourself. Completely optional if you just want to sit back and relax and, and kind of watch me go through them. That's totally fine as well. Um, or you can actually follow along. All right. So let's kick things off talking about what makes debugging shiny applications particularly difficult. Uh, let's just go through this uh, example of some normal R code, so not necessarily within a shiny application. So let's say you have on the top of your R script, you're creating a variable X and you're assigning it the value of one, right? Pretty simple. And then the next step, you print your variable X and then directly underneath that, it actually shows the value one. All right, this is a very linear process. It starts at the top, you sign, you print, it returns the print message underneath, all right? Very linear. Now, if you wanted to change the value of X within this R script, you can just simply delete that one, pop into two and go through the same steps. Assign it to X, print X, and you see the two show up underneath. Very linear in nature. Now, if we take this simple code and wrap it into a shiny application, it may look something like this, where we have a shiny app with a single input box where we have you know, pop in the number one and then directly underneath that box returns, you know, basically just echoes the number one. If we want to change the shiny application, the value of this input X to two, you just type in two and it shows up directly underneath. Now, while this does appear very linear in nature, where you're kind of starting up here and then the printed or the echoed message shows up underneath, underneath the hood, that's not really what's happening, all right? So shiny is reactive, uh, which means shiny is not necessarily linear in nature. So if we take this application and we look at all the steps it takes to basically echo the value that you have in this input box. So we had one and we changed it to a two, what happens? Well, the first thing is that Shiny detects a change, right? So it reacts to any of those input changes, it throws up a red flag and says, hey, I detected something different in one of these inputs. The server portion of your Shiny application then kind of reaches up to that input value and pulls it in. All right, so that's already kind of going against the grain. So it's kind of reaching in the opposite direction. The server then takes that new input value and runs all the code within the server portion to generate that new value. I mean, really here it's just echoing the number two. And then eventually we'll push that value back to the user interface so it can actually show it on the user interface itself. All right, so you can actually see this value too. So there's really a lot of back and forth going on between the Shiny application. And so because of that, can be pretty hard to kind of figure out the flow of your Shiny application. Now, another part of why, you know, debugging Shiny applications can be particularly difficult is because when the application is running, it's running behind a web server, right? And the Shiny framework itself. So when you have an application and you're rendering it, this is what you're seeing, and you're not necessarily seeing the code actually running behind the scenes. And it can be hard to access that code. And then finally, the third reason why making debugging Shiny applications are difficult is that not all bugs are gonna be the same. All right? and there's really kind of three different categories of bugs and we'll walk through all these uh, together today. But the first one is you get an unexpected error. But this is actually kind of the best case scenario because Shiny will in fact return a useful message. So you may see something like this on the right hand side of your screen, error, non-numeric argument to binary operator. This is already kind of pointing some fingers you might also get this thing known as a trace back, which really helps pinpoint where your bug is occurring. And we'll talk about this uh, towards the end of the presentation. But what can be a little bit more frustrating is that you get a bug, but you don't see any errors, right? So some value is incorrect. And at this juncture, you kind of have to put on your Sherlock Holmes hat and grab your magnifying glass and enter what's known as the interactive debugger and use some detective skills to figure out where this bug is actually occurring. Now, the most frustrating bug for Shiny applications is where 
all the values in your application appear correct, but they're not being updated when you expect it. All right, so maybe a user is sliding the bar or clicking a box, and it's not getting the it's getting unexpected behavior. All right, and when this happens, this is an issue with reactivity. And uh, the you know the hard part about this is that reactivity is something unique to Shiny. So when R was you know created as a programming language, Shiny was not around. Shiny was built on top of R and it's a completely different framework. And so a lot of times when you get bugs with those things unique to Shiny, like reactivity, it can be hard, kind of hard to debug. Now, you know, that's a lot of bad news. Um, I'm basically telling you that when you get a bug in a Shiny application, it can be really hard to figure out what's going on and how to fix it, but it's not all bad news. You know, we here at Posit, again, I'm throwing our studio here, um, that we've actually created a lot of tools that can help with debugging Shiny applications. So what we're going to talk about today are tools within the Shiny package itself, but also some tools within the RStudio IDE that can help you debug your code. And we're going to go through three techniques for debugging Shiny applications, tracing, debugging, and error handling. Just to kind of give you a quick uh, preview of uh, these three. For tracing, this is collecting info as your application runs, right, without pausing it. So there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of print messages to yourself or just understand your application as it's currently running. Um, and really the best way to debug your application is knowing beforehand everything that goes into your application. So the more you can learn about your app or someone else's app, um, the better and easier it is going to be to debug. And that can be uh, facilitated using tracing. Then we have debugging. And so this is pausing your application at a place that you choose as the debugger of your application. And once you've paused it, you can kind of step inside of it and investigate and see what's going on. So again, I'm gonna use that Sherlock Holmes uh, detective analogy a lot here for debugging. And then finally you have error handling. So this is typically, again, the best case scenario where you do get a nice error message and it will kind of talk about some techniques to understand you know, or interpret that error message to help you pinpoint where that bug is. So before we start going into these various techniques, I first wanna introduce everybody to the application we're gonna be working with today, all right? This is kind of a spin on the normal Old Faithful Geyser application that comes pre-built into the RStudio IDE. I've just made some tweaks to it to help demonstrate some of these debugging techniques. So from a visual perspective, so looking at the user interface, we have this sidebar layout. So we have our sidebar over here in gray with our main output over here on the right-hand side. And we have three inputs. We have a text input where you can change the title of your application. We have the normal slider bar. So this stays the same. You can slide this to the left and right to change the number of bins in our histogram. And we have the select bin color where you can see it's set to red now. If I wanted to change the bins to blue or green, you can do that using these radio buttons. So let's go ahead and show you this application within the Posit Cloud. So again, if you have um, Posit Cloud, we're gonna go to this directory. So using this, uh, file path right here. All right, so here I am in my instance of Posit Cloud. So hopefully everyone um, that wants to follow along, again, completely optional, but if you want to follow along, you can just follow me here. So in our file directory, we have 01 tracing. So if we click on that, and then we go to 01 working app, we just have this app.r file. All right, you'll see some other stuff in here as well, which we'll talk about in a second, but go ahead and click on that app.r file. And here is our Shiny application. So not particularly long, it's about 70 lines of code. And we can just run it right here within the RStudio IDE. And here's our application, all right? So I can change here the title. So if I add one, two, three, you can see that's now reflected in the output. I can change number of bins. So this operation stays the same. And then I can change the bin color as well. All right. Now, if I come back here, um, let's talk a little bit about the code going into the Shiny application. So it is important that, you know, we're gonna talk a lot about debugging Shiny applications. So it is important that we know what goes into the Shiny app. But fortunately, it's not super complicated, but I do wanna take some time to walk you through. Every, walk it through. So looking just at the user interface, so we have our user interface kind of rendered over here on the right-hand side. And I mentioned there's three basically inputs. We have our plot title, number of bins, and the select bin color. And those are being reflected right here on lines 11 to about 24. So here we have our text input to change the plot title. Then we have our slider input. We're gonna give it the input value of bins. You see our default set to one to 50, so one to 50, and default value set to 30. 
And then we have some radio buttons here to change the bin colors from red to blue or green. And then on our main panel, we just have this single histogram, which we're going to call histplot, shown over here in the main panel. Now, the server portion, um, I tried to space it out to make it a little bit more readable. So let's just walk through it. Uh, starting at line 37, we're just going to assign our data. So the old faithful guys are data, just the second column. We're going to assign it to the value X. And then we have a few reactive statements. So this first reactive um, function here is just going to um, create this plot title reactive function. And the only thing it does is take in that input value from the, from the user interface, right, our title. And for the most part, the next two are gonna do the exact same thing. So the change number of bins, we have our reactive statement. This is just gonna generate that sequence uh, to define the number of bins in our histogram. And then we have bin color, which again, just takes that input bin color value from our user interface. And that's pretty much it. So it's gonna generate three reactive statements, plot title, bins, and bin color. And then we take those three reactive statements and we plop them into the histogram function. All right, so that's what actually draws the histogram. So we have our data, we have our bins reactive statement, bin color, we'll leave the border as black, and the main, uh, um, the title here is plot title. All right, and that's all being generated using this render plot function and assigned the histplot function. All right, so now that we understand our application a little bit more, let's talk about our first debugging technique, and that is going to be tracing. I mentioned before that the best way to debug your application is just knowing as much information about your application as possible. And this is important because, again, most shiny applications are not linear in kind of how they operate. And in fact, they look more like this, where you kind of start someplace and maybe hop to a different part of your application or rewind or kind of repeat some steps. Uh, and because of that, it's just important to understand what's going on as your application is running. Now, probably the, one of the most powerful techniques you can use for tracing is something known as showcase mode. So I mentioned previously that one of the main issues of debugging Shiny applications is that many times you're just interfacing with the user interface. So you can't actually see the code running as you interact with your application. But showcase mode allows you to do that. So here in this GIF here, you can see I'm interacting with my Shiny app, sliding the bar left and right, changing the bin colors. And you can see this app.r script over here. So this is our Shiny application. Anytime code is being executed, it kind of flashes yellow. It gets highlighted in yellow. And so this is a really great way to see, you know, what parts of your code are running and potentially shouldn't be running or vice versa. Maybe something that's not running, it really should be. So let me go through and show you how to run an application using showcase mode. All right. So, Coming back to my file directory here, we're in that same 01 working app. And we have this react, or sorry, showcase.r script, All right? So if you click on this, you should see uh, an app, uh, .r script with just basically one line of code. And you can go ahead and just run this, All right? So I'm just going to hit command enter, run this code. And here we have our application. And just to quickly run through, you know, what the code is actually doing. So this is a tool built within Shiny run app, right, which is just another way to run an application. We give it the directory of our app, and then we give it the display mode equals showcase, right? So there are a few other R scripts in this directory. So this is why you're seeing multiple tabs here, but we're just gonna highlight this app.r. And I like to click on this button to show with app. And that way you can actually see the application right alongside the actual app. And then I'm gonna scroll down to the server. So this is where most of the R code is being executed. And now we have the code and we have a running application. And so I can interact with this. Let me change the title here. And as I do that, you can see this input title flashes and it redraws the histogram. Let me change the bins, move it left and right. And you can see the code being highlighted in yellow as I slide this left and right. And then finally, if you wanna change the bin color, which we can, we know is down here, I can do that by clicking blue, green, blue, red, going back and forth. Okay, so again, just another great way to see the code as you're actually running this application. All right, so let me close this, come back to our slides quick. The next uh, tracing technique, uh, some of you may be familiar with this as well. Uh, this is another open source package. It's called React Log. So I mentioned before that one of the most frustrating um, bugs with Shiny applications is issues with reactivity. All right. 
And so maybe potentially you click on a box and it's just not doing what you expect. And that's going to be something that's unique to Shiny. It can be hard to debug. So because of that, we've created this tool called React Log, which allows you to visualize the reactivity of your Shiny application. So this is just a quick GIF looking at our application. You can see those three inputs over here, our title, bins, and bin color. And then we have our output over here, our his plot. Now there's a lot of stuff that goes on, you know, behind the scenes to generate these outputs. Some things you don't necessarily have to worry about, like you know the his plot height and width, uh, pixel ratio. But there are some intermediary steps as well uh, that need to be considered, and eventually our plot object that needs to be rebuilt. All right, so let me go ahead and show you how to create a React log. So first and foremost, always a good idea to restart your R session frequently. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just restart R really quick. Um, and then we're going to go to the same directory and we have React log. And it's just a few lines of code. So you can see right here, lines one and two, we're just going to load Shiny in the React log package. So I'll go ahead and run that code. And then we want to enable the React log. And this basically starts a recording, right? So think of it as pulling out a fresh piece of paper and you're ready to start logging some nodes. All right, so we're going to go ahead and turn that on. And then we run our application as normal. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and run this app. Here we have it right here. And I'm just going to make one quick change. All I'm going to do is take it from red and switch it to blue. And that's it. It's the only thing I'm going to do. I'll hit stop. And then you can see the last line of code. We're going to react log show. And I'll run this line of code. It's going to open up a new tab. And here's our react log. When you see stuff in green, that basically means that, that it is ready, it's been computed, it's just kind of sitting there idle waiting for uh, you know, a user to make a change. And then at the very top here, you can see you can actually step through our application you know, bit by bit. So if I hit play just once, you can see that this green input color went from uh, red to blue. So if I have it originally as red, I click forward and it switches to blue. And once I do that, that basically invalidates one of these inputs. And that sets off this whole trigger of reactivity. So I'm not going to step through all these components, um, but, but ultimately we need to rebuild this his plot way out here. So I'll just kind of click through this play button and you can see all of the steps, uh, the reactivity steps that go on underneath the hood for your Shiny applications just to generate this uh, new histogram. So you can see once it turns to yellow, that means it's being rebuilt. All right, so it goes through all these steps. That's re-pulling all these height and width parameters, eventually pulling the new inputs as well, build that plot object, and then eventually we will have a rendered Shiny app or the, the new rendered histogram. Okay, so again, this is a great technique to see, you know, potentially something going wrong with your reactivity. You can actually visualize it here using the React log. All right, so coming back to our slides. Um, the last technique we'll talk about tracing is probably the simplest method um, and probably the oldest method out there as well. And this is just literally printing a message, message to the console whenever that line of code is uh, reached. And probably the easiest way to do this within Shiny and the RStudio IDE is to use the cat function, right? And send these messages to the standard error. That will basically print everything to the console of your RStudio IDE. And you can put whatever message you want. So for example, you can put drawing histogram with and then give it the number of bins in your histogram bins um, so that every time this line of code is hit within your Shiny application, it'll print this to the console. So drawing histogram with 30 bins and maybe slide that bar to 35 and it re um, prints a message to the console. So let me show you how this can help, um, you know, uh, basically figure out where your application uh, components are being run. So we'll go to that same directory here, tracing. Uh, well, it's going to be a slightly different directory. So let me just, just go to cloud here. I'm going to close this React log script. Um, and then within the zero one tracing directory, we have a print um, f app, right? Just a single app.r script here. All right, so again, here's the directory path right here. Um, and within this code, if we go, go to the server portion right here, basically within every single reactive statement, I've inserted a cat function. And so, for example, for the plot title, where we basically change the, the title of our plot. I inserted a statement that says changing title to, and then I'm pulling in the input value that's currently set to the title. And that will be printed down here to the console. 
All right, same thing with bins. So we have the number of bins that'll be printed to the console as well. Bin color down here as well. And I also inserted a cat statement right down here. Anytime that a histogram gets rerun or rebuilt, it's gonna let me know that within the console. So if I run this application and I open up my console down here, you can see it's already printed some stuff down here. So it's a rendering histogram with bins 30, titles, old faithful guys or data, and a bin color set to red. Now, if I make a change to my application, so if I come in here and type one, two, three in my title, you can now see it's rendering histogram, changing title to old faithful data one, two, three. And not only is this helpful for kind of seeing what my values are set to with my application, it also lets me know kind of what lines of code are being run with my application. And just to show you a few more examples, I can change the number of bins and you can see how it's being reflected here in the console. And then if I do the same thing with bin color, blue, green, blue, red. And I, super simple way to just understand your application. All right, so tracing is a great way to figure out that potentially something's not right in your application. Maybe you've identified a bug or just something's just not adding up. Um, this is basically being revealed to you using tracing, all those techniques we just talked about. But once you figure out that, in fact, you might have a shiny bug, we need to kind of move into our next step of debugging, and that is debugging itself. So let's talk about a particularly frustrating application. All right, here's the user interface, and I'll show you this here live in a second. We have a title, input value, you can see reflected over here in the output. That looks fine. <clears throat> we have the number of bins set to 30. That looks fine as well. But obviously here we have select bin color. We have it set to red, but we're not seeing red in our bins. And this is particularly frustrating because we're not seeing any type of error message or anything like that. Shiny for the most part sees this as a completely normal application, but you as the user or developer of this application, you know there's something wrong because it really should be red and it's not. So let's talk about this application. Let me just show you this application live first. All right, so let me close this app and go back to my file directory. That's kind of a good uh, little trick here. If uh, you're within a project uh, within the RStudio IDE, you can always go to the project home directory right here by clicking this little icon, this little R with the cube. So I'll bring you to the home directory. And we want to go to debugging 02 and then the no error bug or no error directory. All right, so I'll run this application here. And we see exactly what we just saw in the slides. So title seems to work just fine. Change in our bins, that seems to work just fine. But these radio buttons are not doing anything. All right, and that's frustrating. So we need to figure out how we can fix this. So I mentioned before that a really good technique for debugging your shiny applications is being able to pause it at a very, that's funny, pause it, it's our company name, sorry. Um, pause it at a very specific time point and actually step into your Shiny application and kind of investigate what's going on. So some questions you can ask like, what's in my environment? What are the various variables set to? What are the various inputs and are they correct, All right? And so we can actually do this with our application in a variety of ways. And the first one we're gonna talk about is something known as breakpoints. So if you know or suspect where in your code your problem lies, you can insert what's known as breakpoints. And this is something that's gonna be unique to the RStudio IDE. But basically what you do, um, so for this example, we know that there's an issue with our histogram, right? So it's not drawing the correct bin colors. So a logical place to put a breakpoint would be at where your application draws your histogram. So what you literally do, and this is kind of cool if you've never done this, or maybe you did it accidentally and you don't know what you did. But if you put your mouse, your uh, just hover to the left hand side of the line numbers on your code, and you just click, it'll insert a red dot. And this dot will basically be considered like a stop sign. So once your application runs and it hits that line of code, it's going to stop and enter what's known as the interactive debugger. All right, and these are the kind of like the tools, you know, as Sherlock Holmes, as a detective that you have at your disposal to help investigate your environment. So you, inter you enter into this interactive debugger and then you get some additional controls in there, such as executing the next step of the app. So you can actually walk through the next step and the next step and the next step kind of sequentially. You can actually just run the rest of the application using this continue button, or you can just completely stop it and go back to your global workspace. 
All right, so that's what we're gonna do here now. So we're gonna go back into that application we were just in, that no error app. We're gonna insert a breakpoint right here at line 60, right before we draw this histogram and just ask some questions like, what are the value of each of these? Is bins correct? Is bin color correct? Is plot title correct? All right, so coming back to posit cloud here, let me just clear everything. I'll make my screen a little bit bigger so hopefully that's easier to see. All right, so I have my application here and then we have our histogram right here. All right, so line 60. So like I mentioned before, what you're gonna do is you take your mouse and you just hover it to the left-hand side and you click and that inserts a breakpoint. And then we're gonna rerun the application. And again, once the our interpreter hits line 60, it's gonna stop and it's gonna enter the interactive debugger. All right. So here we have it, you can see the line that basically where it stopped is being highlighted. And we now have our interactive debugger and we can see these in, uh, kind of additional tools we have controls. And then we had this browse uh, kind of prompt. So now that we're in our interactive debug debugger, we can start asking some questions as well. So for example, let me just highlight the code again here. Let's see and make sure the value of bins is correct. So I can copy this, I can just plop it down here, hit enter. That's good. I mean, we have 30 bins. Those seem to be fine, working just fine. All right. Now let's check bin uh, the, the plot title. I don't expect any issues there, but this is kind of a good practice. So we'll check plot title, this reactive statement. Yep, that looks just fine as well. But, you know, if you have to take a guess, I'm probably going to say there's going to be an issue here bin color. So let's go ahead and copy this and see what it returns. And you can see it's set to null. All right, that's probably where our issue is arising is that really this should be red, but it's returning null. And so what do we do? How do we figure out what's going on here? But we basically boiled it down. So we know there's an issue right here with bin color. So we go back to our code and we ask, you know, where did I define this value, this reactive value? So you can see bin color is right here. And the only thing it does is take a single input value from our user interface, bin colors. All right, so that's fine. Let's go back up to our user interface. Let me see our radio buttons. And then here's the gotcha. All right, so our input ID is set to bin color. It is singular. Down here, we have it set as bin colors. And this can be one of the most frustrating parts of Shiny is that a single spelling mistake, adding an S or removing an S, you basically break your application. But this is how we can use that interactive debugger to figure out what's going on. So we can fix this application um, by simply, so let me actually exit the interactive debugger. I'm going to take this S and remove it. And I'm gonna remove this breakpoint so we don't re-enter that debugger and then rerun the application. Let's see if that did it. All right, that looks a lot better. So now it's in blue, green, blue, green. That looks good. All right, so that is how we can use the interactive debugger. The another um, thing I wanna mention here as it pertains to the breakpoints, so, what we've done so far, you know, we click to the left-hand side of these line numbers and enter that little uh, red dot. This is something that's unique to the RStudio IDE, all right? If you want to do this in a more source code fashion, the same, these two lines of code or blocks of code you're seeing right here do the exact same thing. But instead of adding the breakpoint by clicking right here, we can actually enter what's known as a browser function, all right? And this will do the exact same thing. As the Shiny interprets this application, it hits a browser statement, it'll stop it right there and enter the interactive debugger. And so if I go back to the RStudio Cloud instance, go back to my files, um, within this uh, debugging here, we have a no error browser. So I'll open up this application and you can see down here, well, actually before I talk about this, let me go back to the slides. There's one additional thing I wanna mention here. So when you have um, the browser, which is source code into your application, you can do some really you know, helpful kind of checks or tests for your application. And using it, these if else statements can be really powerful here. So let's say for example, you want to enter the interactive debugger only if bin color, so that reactive function is missing. So you can set up an if statement. So if is null bin color, enter the interactive debugger. If it's not null or something else like red, blue, or green, it'll just pass right through it and execute your Shiny application as normal. So that's what we're doing here in this example right here. So I've entered here on line 60, this little check to see you know, if bin color, this reactive statement is null, it'll enter the interactive debugger. And so you can see up here, I still have this S right here. So 
if all goes according to plan, if I run this application, this should equate to null and we should in enter the interactive debugger. So let's go ahead and run this application. And it in fact did so. All right, and then we can come in here and I can say, yep, in fact, bin color. Yep, that's null. That's why we're in the interactive debugger. And then we would just fix the application in the exact same fashion. All right, we would come in here, we can move this S, rerun the application, and now it behaves just as normal. All right, so a good way to add some tests to your application um, is to make sure all of your input values are correct. All right, so we only have one more technique to talk about, and that is probably, again, the best scenario to be in. Um, and oftentimes when you run an application, you're gonna get into a scenario that looks like this, where you open up the application, you're not seeing anything in the main panel or some output. Instead, you're seeing this red text error, could not find function bin colors or some message. A lot of times it can be really helpful because this already points some fingers, right? It's saying this function bin colors, it's not finding it. And that already kind of tells us where we should start looking. So let me go ahead and show you this application here quick. So if you go to error handling, the 01 directory error, it's just a single app file in there. So again, we'll come to files. You can go back to our home directory right here. And we have error handling, error app. So let me run this application. And you can see the exact same thing. I right? could not find function bin colors. And at the exact same time down here in the console, you'll see we get some text being spit out here. This is known as a traceback. We're gonna spend some time talking about what this is actually telling us because it really helps point with a really kind of a lot of um, resolution what actually is being uh, happening with our application. All right, so here's the traceback, uh, the same traceback I just highlighted in that application. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about how to interpret this. So I've just highlighted it here. Now, the first thing we should do, when you see a traceback here, you're gonna see all these kind of random looking numbers to the left-hand side of all these lines of code. For the most part, you can ignore these, but probably the most important is that you should really in your head, flip these kind of the order of these uh, statements. So really you should start with the lowest number and work your way up right, in order to understand these tracebacks. So what I'm just gonna go ahead and do is do that manually. Um, but again, you kind of have to do this uh, you know, in your head when you're working with these tracebacks. So always start with a low number and work your way up. Now, again, you can, for the most part, ignore these numbers. They're not super relevant to um, folks that are debugging Shiny application. These are just calls to the call stack, right? the indices in the call stack. If for some reason you wanna see every single message that's printed in that call stack, you do have the option to change the options within Shiny. So you can do options, Shiny full traceback equals true. And that will print out literally every line from one all the way to 172. But Shiny does some really cool stuff under the hood to only pull out the lines of code that would be most informative to you as a developer to debug your Shiny applications. And that's what's being shown here. All right, so let's go ahead and just walk through these various lines uh, in our traceback. And the first one, a lot of times, is going to be the same for every single traceback, is run app. All right, and so this is going to correspond to the last line on our Shiny application, the Shiny app function, which just tells the application to run. All right, that's kind of the first step into all tracebacks here. The next six lines here in our traceback um, are basically pointing some fingers. They're kind of helping us out to find where exactly things are happening. So you can see here on line 81, we see output dollar sign his plot. And this is already incredibly informative because this tells us almost exactly where we should be looking in our application. So output dollar sign his plot, we know that occurs right here on lines 58 when we're drawing this histogram. All right, so we already know we're kind of within this function somewhere, right? This is all the internal shiny code in charge of calling the reactive expression, right? All the stuff you see right here. We go a little further in a traceback and we can start to get a little bit more fine grained of where exactly within this output, his plot kind of render plot function, our application is hitting a, an issue. So we see render plot and then we start seeing things like hist default, plot histogram, and then rect, which is actually shorthand for rectangle. So after doing a quick Google search of like, you know, what this rect function actually is, turns out it's an issue with the histogram where the plot actually that the rectangles that represent our bins and our histogram, they can't be drawn. All right, so that is the actual function that's spitting out this error is that it's this rect function, it can't create the rectangles. 
And this boils it down even further. I mean, it's a pretty simple application. You might have more lines of code in your render plot functions, but we know it's pretty much within this hist function, the issue is arising. So what do we do? Now that we've used this traceback to help inform us where this debug, this bug is occurring, we can use some of our detective skills, like inserting some breakpoints and investigating what's going on. So we put in this red dot, or you can put in a browser statement, and you ask some questions like, is our title good? Yep, looks good. Is bins good? Yeah, it looks fine. But then we try to type in bin colors and we get the same error message that was printed to the Shiny console, all right? Uh, to the, the kind of where the main panel should be. It says bin colors could not find function bin colors. So let's go over here uh, and let's go ahead and fix this application. Let's do exactly that. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop this app, come down here to um, where we draw the histogram. So I'll just go ahead and I'll pop it right there at line 60 and we'll run this application. So now I've entered my interactive debugger. And just to kind of prove that point here, if I go to bin colors, hit enter, it's saying could not find function bin colors. And then we start working our way backwards. You know, where did we define bin colors? Well, it looks like we tried to define it right here. Bin color, input dollar sign bin color. And this is the same issue we had before, just kind of in a different manner where we really should have an S here, all right, in order to um, make sure it matches exactly the line that she done here. Or you can optionally delete that S. So feel free to do that in your own time when you have your session. So I'll go ahead and remove this breakpoint. I'm gonna stop this interactive debugger and then we'll rerun this application. And now it seems to work just fine. All right. So let me go ahead and just make that change back so I don't forget. And we'll come back here to our slides and just wrap things up here. All right, so hopefully, um, you know, there's certainly a ton of other techniques for debugging Shiny applications, especially as your applications start to grow in complexity. But a lot of these are good starter points um, and just good best practices for uh, understanding your application, debugging it, you know, if you pausing your application, stepping inside it, figuring out what's going on, and then also how to interpret these various error messages uh, that you're seeing. The last thing I want to mention here um, is probably one of the most important things that um, you all here are probably very familiar with. You know, having just you know been at the NHSR conference last week, there's obviously obviously a very strong community presence, not only within the Slack channel, um, but other ways as well. So if you have a shiny application or any type of R code and you just can't figure out what's going on, you've tried all these techniques, you can't debug this bug that's been frustrating you for a couple of days now. There are ways that you can ask the community for help. So beyond your, your internal Slack channel, which is great, uh, we do have a few things here at uh, a positive that can help out. Um, well, there's Stack Overflow, which I guarantee you, if you've done any type of coding, you've probably Googled something and found yourself on Stack Overflow. There are certainly tons of shiny related questions on Stack Overflow. But if you want a more personalized experience, um, something that's very similar to Stack Overflow, but it's really tailored to all things, our studio, posit, shiny, you can post your questions to um, our, our studio community channel as well. So let me just quickly show you what that looks like here. All right, so this is our uh, new posit community. You can see the branding is now updated. And we can scroll down here and you can see there's a ton of these questions that are being posed here. If I look quickly, maybe I can try to find a, here's a shiny one right here. All right, so you can actually post some, you know, information about your Shiny application, maybe some of the error messages, and then you can have some folks, you know, chime in here, can you share this code, uh, and have some back and forth. So it's a really great way to just get some help from the community as it relates to your Shiny applications. But there's one important thing to note here, is that when you're debugging stuff, it can be very frustrating. And when you finally kind of determine like, oh, okay, I'm just gonna ask the community to see if I can help, it can be very tempting to just like copy all the code in your shiny application and just paste it into a community uh, question and just say, please help me, all right? You really, what you need to do is to the best of your ability, you need to boil down your issue, all right? So for example, if you're getting an issue where you know some numeric value is not being recognized, it really doesn't make sense to incorporate all the other parts of your shiny application that aren't related to that error message. So the best way to do it is to boil it down in what's known as a reprex or a reproducible example so that someone can copy the, the code that you pasted into you uh, put in that question and can run it in their own environment. 
Now, Shiny applications can be particularly difficult because they are interactive. Uh, sometimes it bodes better for just like static R code, but there are ways to do it as well. So for example, here is an example of Reprex for a Shiny application. So if we go to Posit Cloud, we go back to our home directory here. Now we have this 04 Reprex directory. We just have a single app file. And this is just a I'm demonstrating an example of an application that anyone here on the line, if you have Shiny installed on your system, you can copy this and you can run it in your own environment. All right. So it doesn't depend on any data that's only unique to me. You know, I can see here that I'm just kind of generating a, my own vector of data. I can run this application and I can regenerate this error message that's been causing me a lot of issues for a while now. But this is much easier to digest and much easier for the community to help debug for you or to, uh, with you for the most part. Okay, so just try to keep that in mind when you're posting to these channels that you know we want the, the community, they want you to help them. All right, so uh, boiling things down is the best way possible. All right, so that's pretty much all I have for debugging Shiny apps. Um, again, I'll share these slides with everyone, including the Shiny production um, presentation we had previously, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing there and see if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Awesome. So I think we have um, one kind of um, question in the chat. Um, do people write um, our shiny apps with something similar to unit tests in Python? So mm. it's definitely the test that package. And yeah, yeah. So that's probably the one I would recommend. I haven't had um, too much. Uh, I haven't played around with it too much, but the package right here, I'll post into the chat that uh, Tom was just referring to um, for writing unit tests within Shiny applications. There's a package, an open source package that we've developed uh, for that. So give that a try. Um, I think that should hopefully meet your needs. I think there's also a um, shiny test and is there a shiny test two now? Yep. Um, yeah, shiny test more, two is new. Are they more end to end testing rather than unit testing, I think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, shiny test two is. I should actually, um, what I might actually do instead is the engineer who developed shiny test two. Uh, presented at our conference uh, back in July, where he kind of introduced Shiny Test 2 uh, and walked through some examples. That might be even a better resource. So what I did is I just posted that YouTube channel there. Um, it's pretty short. It's only like 10 minutes long, um, but it's a really good introduction into some of the uh, packages and techniques for unit testing and Shiny applications. I'll, I'll try to remember to get that added to the, um, the notes for YouTube stream. So if people are watching this, hopefully it's in the description. If it isn't, you can break me on um, Slack or any other medium. All right. Well, thanks all again for allowing me to come speak here today. Uh, it was really fun. Uh, I just want to highlight how much fun we had, Lauren and I had last week at uh, the, the conference. And hopefully uh, we can come back next year with some more exciting stuff from Posit. Thanks all. And I'll send these slides uh, over to Tom and Mohammed in a little bit here. Uh, but thanks again.